John Walker Lynn, the man who became known as American Taliban, was released from federal prison today for good conduct, three years short of his 20-year sentence. Lawmakers and Trump administration officials today criticized the move, saying that he was still an extremist. And as Nick Schifrin reports, his release brings up larger questions of how the U.S. deals with convicted radicals. He was disoriented and used his adopted name. But John Walker Lynn was unmistakably American. My father, my father's name is Lynn. It's Frank. Lynn was a 20 year old American who'd become an American enemy, captured alongside Taliban fighters in late 2001. He was born in California, grew up in a Catholic family, and converted to Islam. In 2000, he traveled to this religious school in Pakistan to study Quran. And then he crossed the border into Afghanistan to volunteer to fight for the Taliban. He arrived at the front lines on September the 6th, just before 9-11. He was captured in December, and CIA officer Johnny Mike Spann interrogated him in video filmed by Afghan intelligence. Hey, look at you. You know the people that you're here watching with are terrorists? Shortly after, prisoners, including Lind, rioted, and Spann was killed. Law enforcement brought Lynn back to face charges and Spann's death, but in a plea bargain, he admitted only to illegally supporting the Taliban. This week, Spann's daughter Allison wrote to President Trump requesting that Lynn not be released. She spoke to ABC News. He's responsible in some part for the death of my father, and so for him to be released early just was unbelievable. That dismay was echoed today by President Trump. But we'll be watching him. We'll be watching him closely. What bothers me more than anything else is that here's a man who has not given up his proclamation of terror. And we have to let him out. In 2002, Lynn released a statement saying, quote, he never understood jihad to mean anti-Americanism or terrorism. I condemn terrorism on every level unequivocally. But two U.S. government assessments since then concluded Lind has made pro-ISIS comments and, quote, continued to advocate for global jihad and to write and translate violent extremist texts. Lind was released on certain conditions. He cannot possess an Internet-capable device without permission or constant monitoring. He cannot view or access extremist or terrorist material or communicate with extremists. And he must undergo mental health counseling. That leads to bigger questions. How should the U.S. release convicted extremists? And should the U.S. try to de-radicalize them? Kevin Lowry recently retired as chief probation officer for the U.S. District Court in Minnesota. He established the only de-radicalization program in the country for accused extremists. Kevin Lowry joins me now. Thank you very much. Welcome to the News Hour. Let's start with those supervised release conditions for John Walker Lind. Are those sufficient to make sure that Lind or anyone like him who's been convicted of these crimes doesn't stay radical in the future? Well, I don't think that they're foolproof and there's a 100 percent guarantee with anything. What we do is we set up conditions to monitor, provide monitoring, surveillance, correctional treatment throughout the course of supervision. Throughout watching behavior very closely, we'll know and monitor how people are doing under supervision. We never take people's word for what they are doing or their commitment, but we watch their actions and therefore those conditions are paramount in both public safety and ensuring that there is correctional or rehabilitative treatment for extremists. There's an irony, it seems to me. The U.S. actually funds de-radicalization programs overseas, as you know, because you visited some of those programs overseas. There is no national U.S. de-radicalization program, even though about 80 or 90 convicted terrorists will be released uh, in the next few years. So do you think it's possible to take the program that you did in Minnesota uh, and make it a national program? I believe that it's possible that it could be a model for national programming. I think each can community is different. It has different challenges based on the circumstances. We have a large immigrant population that creates a certain challenge for us, and other communities have different challenges. And they have large groups of white extremists, for example. Those are also terrorism cases and will need to be addressed in the same fashion that other extremism or terrorism is addressed. 
But I think that we're on the right track, but we need focus and funding. Right now, when you're talking about a country as large as the United States, and you can talk about just a few efforts or programs across the country, that's not a good situation to be in, considering the number of defendants and offenders that we have coming through our system. When you look at the U.K., the PREVENT program, when I visited with them, they had a $67 million a year budget, and a lot of both government programs and non-government programs funded as a result of that in the area of dealing with extremist cases. There's also the question of reintegration or, or perhaps even integration. John Walker Lynn, for example, left the U.S. when he was a teenager. He's been in prison for 17 years. He needs an apartment. He needs a job. Talk about the, the challenges of integration. How important is it to have infrastructure to help people like Lynn, like people who have been convicted of these crimes, uh, who are going to be released? Well, I think it's important to note that as probation and pretrial services, this is our profession. We do this with many high-risk offenders and a number of different types of offenders that range from sex offenders to cartel, and now we have a growing group of extremist or terrorism cases that are coming out. That's our profession. We need to expand our knowledge and our base of community resources with mentors, counseling, and community services that are focused on extremist cases, and that's a challenge because there's not a lot of incentive throughout the United States for programs to be involved in the, that type of programming as much as there has been for, say, substance abuse programming. And, and just very quickly, do you believe there should be that kind of programming nationally? No, I think it's very important, and I think that there's going to need to be a lot of funding put out, and it's going to have to be a commitment to where it's steady funding over a long period of time. It's not a fix that's going to happen in a year, two years, three years. I think it's going to be five years before we even see, you know, is the program that we're using currently working, what adjustments were being made, and what kind of funding will be available to make adjustments. And if we lose sight of that, and uh, the, we'll continue to ask ourselves these same questions every time there's a catastrophic event, which unfortunately has become our new normal. Kevin Lowry, who established the first de-radicalization program for accused extremists from Minnesota, thank you very much. You're welcome.